position and be placed on Christ because he became your substitute. Then all your sins are taken away. And God says, I don't remember any sin against you. There is peace. There is reconciliation. There is fellowship now between you and the Almighty God because Jesus paid it all. He paid the price. He says in verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinance, in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace is the one that has made that peace between us and God possible. He tells us in verse 16, and that he might reconcile, that's the word, that he might reconcile both unto God. When he says both, he's thinking about the Jews on the one hand, and he's thinking about the Gentiles on the other hand. And he says Jewish sinners, Gentile sinners, is there any difference between them? Yes and no. Yes, because the Jewish sin is different from the Gentile sin. Yeah, but they're still sinners. Therefore, in one way, they were different. The Jewish people, at the time of Jesus, they were totally free from idolatry. You won't find idolatry in Israel at the time of Christ. The persecution, the problem, the captivity in Babylon are taking away idolatry from that nation. But they were still committing other sins. And now, whether they are terrible sinners like the Gentiles or the superficial mild sinners like the Jews, both of them were reconciled unto God through Jesus Christ. And then it says in verse, uh, in verse 17, And came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, the Gentiles, and to them which were nice, the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father, now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God. You see very clearly there that Jesus paid the price. And because he paid the price, now we're reconciled unto God. And it's very simple now. Jesus opened the gate. And he says, now you can come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and a heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because of that invitation, as we respond to the invitation of Christ, whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. Because of that invitation of Christ, the moment you respond, like many who responded this morning, you are brought into relationship, father-child relationship with the Almighty God. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, the price of reconciliation with God in Christ. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Do you see that? Through the, through the blood of his cross. It's not anything you do. It's not anything I do. What can be greater than the blood of Jesus? What can be greater than the death of Jesus? What can be greater than the substitutionary death of Christ for you and for me and for the whole world? And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile. By Christ to reconcile, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked words, 
yet now are see reconciled. That's the price he paid. And that is the result, the fruit of that price. That because he died for you, on the basis of that death, on the basis of that sacrifice, on the basis of the goodness of the Lord towards you, you can come and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Now I surrender and I give my heart, my life unto you. And then all your sins are taken away. Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He had to take on the nature of man so that he'll die for us. And then it says, we now see him crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He tasted death for every man. What's the meaning of that? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But he was sinless, spotless, perfect, righteous, and God said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He had no sin, but you had sin, but I had sin. But the whole of the world, humanity had sin. But now, Christ took our death penalty. He is righteous, he is holy, he is perfect. He doesn't marry to die. But we merited the death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But God, Jesus said, I'll do it for you. I'll bear it for you. I'll take it for you. He tasted death for every man. I want you to mark that in your Bible, the latter part of verse 9. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for, what are the last two words? Tell me out loud. The reason I asked you for that is, you know, there are some people that only say a selected few will be saved. They say an elect will be saved. And then they say the majority of people, they will not be saved. They cannot be saved. Because there is no predestination of salvation for them. What they are saying is, Christ tasted death only for some people. But the word of God says, by the grace of God, that Christ tasted death for how many? Tell me again. Every man, salvation is yours. I said salvation is yours. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, that's you, that's me, that's us, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, thank God you will not perish, but have everlasting life. He tasted death for every man. Verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things. And by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them. Brethren, now there's a relationship. Because of what he had done, and because of your response to what he did, that reconciliation, that then makes salvation available for you. And that makes all your sins you ever committed, sins you were born, when you came to Christ, everything wiped away. And now he says you are reconciled with him. I'm looking at verse 17. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him, befitted him, to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest 
in sins pertaining to God. Listen to this. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. That's what he came to do. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And the moment you believe in Christ, that reconciliation takes place. Romans chapter 5. Reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when or yet without stress, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You know, there are some people that think that Christ died for good people. That's why they say, I'm not good enough yet. When I become good, then I will come. No, you don't have to become good. He died for the ungodly. Other people say, there are too many sins in my life. I feel so guilty. I feel rotten. I'm so corrupt. I'm so terrible. You don't want a person like me, your church. God wants you in fellowship with him. And all those sins you are talking about, that you feel you are so corrupt, you are so rotten, Christ already died for you. It says, for when we were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Come, and he will receive you. Then it says in verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more then. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10. For if when we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. When we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. That's the price. That's the price he paid for reconciliation. Much more than being reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. And this reconciliation, the price he paid, almost everywhere you turn in the New Testament, you come across it. In First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but for the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. That's the price he paid. He shed his blood for you, for me, and for everybody. And the moment you turn away from your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Salvation is yours. Forgiveness is yours. Reconciliation takes place. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18. For Christ also, as one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. You see that? Do you see why the just suffered for the unjust? What the Lord suffered for the slaves and the captives of sin is that He, by His sacrifice, by His blood, might bring us to God. And that's reconciliation. When the Lord takes the sinner and the sins are forgiven, and then He brings you to God, you are reconciled with God. Then it says in that verse 18, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the Spirit. You say, do I have to do anything? Well, just, just, just turn to the Lord. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. This is what you do. After the price he has paid. After the agony that he went through. After the death. That he died, agonizing death for you on the cross of Calvary. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. 
Repent ye therefore and be converted the soul, the soul. To repent means to turn away from those things you did that brought the separation between you and God. To repent means that you turn away from that thing that brought enmity between you and God. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of repression shall come from the presence of the Lord. Verse 20 says unto you, First, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. What blessing is that? In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's what Christ has done. And that's your response to what Christ has done. Any promise of restoration? Now, you come to Christ and you know the Lord. And maybe after you have known the Lord, the devil became jealous of your fellowship with the Lord, of your relationship with the Lord, of your ability to worship the Lord. And of the glory that you are bringing to his name. He became jealous and he felt he could make use of you. And he needed you in his kingdom too. I told you about Peter. Peter was the person that came to the Lord. The sins were totally forgiven when the Lord met him. That was a great miracle. Catching a lot of fish. And then Peter said, depart from me, O Lord, because I'm a sinful man. And the Lord said, Fear not, from now on you'll catch men. And he was reconciled unto God. He became a child of God, a disciple of Christ, a friend of Christ. And then if you know him, you know Peter, from what you read in the Bible, very dedicated to the Lord. And then the devil became jealous. The devil wanted him. And he wanted him to go away from the Lord so that he can be a slave again. And eventually it happened to Peter. You know the story. And when Peter knew what happened, he cried. Peter tears. But thank God there is promise of restoration. I said thank God there is promise of restoration. That if somebody has gone away from the Lord, don't let the devil kill you in the wilderness. We will not die in the wilderness. We are going to get to Canaan land. You know, the devil could have his way. He will want to kill and destroy every backslider in the wilderness, in the far country. But because of the love of Christ for you, he says, I died for him. I know that in the moment of carelessness, see what the devil has done. But I'm not going to allow the devil to have him permanently. You will come back. The promise of restoration to God through Christ. Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. And we're reading from verse, verse 18. Micah chapter 7 verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee, that partners iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. You see, the nature of God is so loving, is so merciful. And then you have seen, you have gone away from the Lord. And then he comes to you and he says, come back home. And then you say, but I feel so guilty. I feel so useless and worthless. I feel so unworthy i cannot come to you again he says but i pass by your transgression i'm not even going to talk about that all i'm asking you is come back and i will receive you that's what god does you say god like thee who partners iniquity and passes by the transgression of his of the remnant of his heritage he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighted in mercy god are you not angry with me because of the bad things I've done? He says, yes, I was. He went against my will. And I don't appreciate.